Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> I mean, I'm telling Pastor uh, Randall, like, and I don't mean this nicely, but sometimes that's a little nuts. I mean, he drives back and forth and then back again. I've just been following him around. I'm just like, what do we do next? So <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to roll. But uh, I did say that if, if you're preaching to someone, but I do understand Spanish, so it was very edifying to me. As a matter of fact, I've never heard her uh, uh, because he lives in Spanish, so it was nice to hear it in, in Spanish and just... Yeah, here we, we, we sang different songs in Spanish uh, when we were growing up. Like, Yo tengo un amigo que me ama. Has anybody ever heard that one? No? Okay, then never mind. I won't sing it for you guys then. But you're there in, uh, you're there in 1 Corinthians 2.14. And the title of the sermon today is Uncommon Tongues to Be Aware of. Uncommon Tongues to Be Aware of. And so I understand that there's... This is a church plant, so this this group or this congregation, even though it's part of the same congregation, you know, it's a little bit different. And one of the things that I've noticed about it, not only in difference, is that that one's established. It's been around. I think Pastor Randall, you know, took over after a while. So that church has been there for quite some time. I mean, I'd say at least 20 years plus, right? Um, you know, 70 years, you know. So I, I come from a similar church, you know, Spring Crest. Uh, Pastor Cobb took over. The other day we were sitting there looking at the records. It's been, it's been through like thick and thin. It's been there for like 70 years. You know, it's a, it's a church that has a history and all that. But you guys, I think you're coming up on three years or you're on your third year. And so one of the things that happens in a church is that, you know, especially in the newer churches, you're still kind of figuring out your personality. And there's still like some things that you're, you're new to or you might understand some parts of Scripture, but you're still, I mean, there might be things that you're still spiritually in the milk on and things that you're still uh, spiritually, you have got that meat, right? But one of the things that I think is real interesting is when you're talking about missions, um, and I said this earlier this morning, I was thinking, what do you want to bring someone? I don't want to bring like a, a run-of-the-mill missions uh, conference type of, of uh, message, not because I'm trying to be different, just because those kind of messages are always kind of just very surface, very fluff, and you know they don't really, they're not going over much. I, I wanted to bring the Word of God to you and hopefully leave you with something that'll help you as you grow your mission-minded, you know, ministry as the church grows. And, you know, that's always going to be the main focus and part of what you guys are trying to accomplish here, not only in KC, but even in Iola and throughout the world, right? I mean, the reason that we have a zeal and we, we, we're peculiar, even within our Baptist brethren folk, is that we're willing to go out there into the highways and the hedges. You know, I love the hymns that you guys pick, you know, stand up, stand up. That's one of my favorite hymns, you know, against unnumbered foes. I mean... What are one billion people in Latin America alone? That's unnumbered foes. I mean, we can number them, but we really don't know the exact numbers, right? And when you're out there, it's a it's a real battle. You know, one of the things I love about Christianity is, um, as far as the, you know, when you read it from the Bible, is you know, Christianity is a war. You know, and, and I like that about it. I like you know, as a guy, we kind of like those movies. I remember growing up in the '80s. Now that I look back, it's kind of different. I've said this before at other in other sermons, but. Uh, you know, in the 80s, we were we were fans of like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone because, you know, Rambo and and Predator and stuff. And now that I'm, you know, like you grow up and you put away childish things, and you become a man, you realize like, you know, no guy's going to run around without a shirt and try to pick fights with everybody. You know, you're going to get into the battle. You're going to prepare. Right. And one of the things that w when you're out in the mission is we, we tend to look at the tongues as, you, you know, Spanish English, uh, Korean, or whatever. But the tongues that I want to look at, and I was touching, it's kind of building up, so I would encourage you to like at least listen to the sermon that I preached this morning, is building on that, you know, you, you have a spiritual tongue, the language of God's Word, right? And there's, there's certain things that stand out even in God's Word that are long, in, in, uh, a tongue, and, and what I want to do there is go there to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are, uh, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And I love that verse because it's like, that's why we're not afraid of, you know, civil justice when it comes against God's word, because they can't judge you. You know, I'm willing to go to jail for the gospel. If that's the case, I hope not. But if that's the case, because it's not really a judgment. But anyways, I, I, that's just a side note just came to me right now. But and verse 16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? And it's funny because it's asking the question. It's almost like a rhetorical question. But the question is answered. It says, but we, we have the mind of Christ. 
we do know the mind of Christ. He left us his word. And so in the way of introduction, just so you guys know that I'm not just kind of, because it's going to sound, it's not weird, but it is just extrapolating deep into the word of God a little bit. Uh, you know, the tongue, if you look up the definition, it has like 28 definitions. I didn't realize the tongue had so many definitions. I knew it had several, but not 28. But the definitions that I'm focused on is I'm not talking about like the physical tongue or like a leather strap, you know, when you leave a, a little bit of a tongue or things like that. I'm talking about, uh, you know, these definitions, like the human tongue as an organ, organ of speech. So, I mean, we talk about like Spanish, but even in Spanish, there's different dialects, there's different accents. Even here, you know, I've picked up on stuff. I think yesterday, I forgot what he uh, he said, uh, uh, we're coming here or something like that. And I heard something completely different because he rolls his 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 English different than we do in Texas. You know, we, we're more of y'all and we have a twang. And even myself, I don't really necessarily have an accent. I, I had one of the ladies at church today after she's like, oh, you know, you're Mexican and you don't have an accent. But, you know, we assimilated differently than some of my friends. I have friends that grew up the way I did that have a, a Mexican accent. When they speak in, in English, you can tell that they're from a foreign language. It's just you grow up in different, you know, you develop the tongue differently. Then uh, another definition is the faculty or power of speech. Um, another definition is speech or talk, especially mere glib or empty, empty, empty talk, sorry. Uh, manner or character of speech, the language of a particular people, region, or nation, a dialect. In the Bible, a people or nation distinguished by its language. So the tongue can carry many different meanings. And the one, the, what I want to tell you is there's uncommon tongues in the sense that you're not thinking about this when you're reading the Bible. But hopefully you'll take a look at it differently. And not only that, this is not a, like an exhaustive list. I would encourage you to, to study this and maybe create your own list uh, along this because it helps you recognize what you're dealing with out there. Right? Well, the first thing that I want to point out is you know, we, there's a natural tongue. In spite of whatever language, whatever, you know, I don't care if you speak Swahili or uh, English or whatever language you guys are going to cover. I think next next month, I mean, next week is Asian, right? So Chinese, Mandarin, Cantonese, I don't care what it is. All men that are not saved speak a natural tongue. The Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit. And the first thing we got to understand is when we're dealing with people is, you know, when you're new to ministry, especially soul winning ministry, one of the things I've seen in you soul winners is they get real excited because they now they know stuff that nobody else knows. I remember my dad, my dad was real good about putting me in my place. My dad's a scholar. He's a doctor by by profession, but he's really more of a scholar. He's written books on diabetes and his books like one of those madman crazy libraries. And, you know, if you ever go, he has like drives and drives and drives. They're not movies. They're not documentaries. They're just literally articles and articles and articles about medicine. And, you know, one of the things he always was like, he's like, one of the challenges you're going to have, son, is as you get older, you're going to read something that's going to be new to you. And so you think nobody else knows about it. So you're going to go around telling everybody like this new thing that you discovered that nobody else has ever discovered. And that's really what new Christians do when they're out soul winning, right? You discover, now you understand the gospel and the Trinity and this and that. And then what do you start doing? You start arguing all this doctrine. But the Bible says you're arguing in vain. The natural man understandeth not the things of the spirit. So when we're out soul winning, when we're out in the mission field, the first thing we need to understand is when we're going out into the mission field, even to foreign countries, like if we were going to go to Latin America, there's people out there that don't understand what you want to argue with them about or what you want to or forget arguing what you want to teach them. That's why we have to first give them the gospel, right? Turn over to Isaiah 30 and I'm going to read for you 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, I'm sorry. We're there in 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Sorry. My, uh, the, the, I didn't want to bother you anymore, Pastor Randall, but the uh, color printer wasn't working right. So I just printed black and white. And so usually I have my colors and so I'm, I have repetitive verses here. So that was my mistake. But, um, but you're there in Isaiah 30 and go to verse 1. And it says, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. They walk to go down to Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. So the first thing you want to see here is, obviously he's speaking to the children of Israel. They're spiritual, and I'm talking about the natural tongue, but where, they're, where, where do they seek their help? They're going to the natural man. They're just going to the world. 
And sometimes even in ourselves, even in our, in our zeal to go out soul winning, to go and learn a new language, we, we, we look to other resources. And I'm not, we were just talking about how, you know, Pastor Randall is learning Spanish and he's using other resources. I'm not preaching against that. I'm just saying before we go about that, we've got to get the right type of, uh, you know, we've got to have a plan. Because if not, you just jump around and you're going to waste your time and do all that. But if we keep reading there, it says, uh, verse, they walk down in, into Egypt and, and have not asked at my mouth. See, I know one of the things that uh, at, at least I can speak on that is anybody who obviously is going to learn a different language for soul winning, at some point maybe prayed about it. And I can maybe speak for pa Pastor Rano that he's prayed about it. This is something that he feels that the Lord might have for him, right? You know, I, I try to learn Greek because I wanted to give the, the, uh, the gospel in Greek, but I didn't learn it. So maybe that's not what the Lord had for me. Or maybe I didn't follow through. I'm not here to, you can judge me later on that. But what I'm saying is, but I've asked the Lord for that, right? Here he says, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadows of Egypt. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. For his princes were at Zoan and his ambassadors came to Hanes. They were all ashamed of the people that could not profit them, nor be in help nor profit, but a shame and also reproach. The burden of the beast of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence came the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches upon their shoulders of young, on the, upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. I was talking about it this morning. You know, the word vain, it means unprofitable. This is for no profit. It says, for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is to sit still. Now go, write it before them in a, tab in a, ta uh, in a table and note it in a book that it may be for a time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seer, see not, and the prophet, prophesy not us to, unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to seize from before us. You say, what does this have to do with, you know, the natural man tongue? Is There's many ways that we can get caught up in arguing with the natural man. Obviously, we're still living in the flesh, and when we are not in the spirit, what are we? We're in the natural man, right? We're still, there. the Bible talks about that battle. But here, you know, the fact that the more time we spend trying to convince the natural man of anything or seeking the natural man, the more in danger we are of becoming lazy in what we want to hear in our doctrine. And if you don't believe that, just ask any evangelical Christian who their hero is, and it might not be Jesus Christ, it might be Donald Trump. I mean, am I, if, if I was exaggerating, I wish I was, but it's not the exaggeration. I mean, Donald Trump's not even our president anymore. And people are still hoping, there's a small remnant of people that are hoping that somehow Donald Trump's going to show up on the scene and be like, I am the president. All this fraud happened. Biden, you're out. And then everybody would be like, woo, you know, they'd be excited, right? But it's because what are you doing? You're spending time with the natural man understandeth not the things of the spirit. So don't spend thing, your time in natural things. And I mean that spiritual stuff, right? I mean, obviously we live in the world. We have to do natural things, but don't spend time arguing at the door because you think, oh, well, I think I can convince that guy. But if you do it long enough, you know what you're doing? You're not improving your gospel message. If you're not, if you're constantly just trying to prove someone wrong, you know, we had a guy yesterday who was trying to convince me that Jesus was not God. I, I didn't even waste any time with him. I just ignored, I literally ignored him. He kept interrupting, but the guy that, that I was talking to that was interested, we led him to the Lord. Now, younger me would have like sat there for an hour and, and have, who's been soul winning with a new, like zealous soul winner? And, it, and, and you, I'm the, I'm really sometimes the nice guy. I don't want to pick, you know, like interrupt. Maybe I, I, as I get older, I'll be tougher. I remember I went soul winning with one guy and we sat at the door for like almost an hour to no avail. You know, it's just like this constant going back and forth when that hour could have been spent soul winning on a bunch of other homes, door knocking a bunch of other people. Go to second Peter. Two, go to Second Peter 2. The second tongue I want you to be uh, aware of is the unnatural tongue. And we all know this, you know, the reprobate tongue or the unnatural tongue. Because there is a difference. We want to at least plant the seed on a natural person. 
That's why we knock the door. That's why we teach. You know, we go so we give you soul winning tips. That's why we we maybe leave them with a verse, or we say, hey, go to, go to this website, or maybe read the verses in the back. Right? We don't want to just ignore them, because because if you plant that seed, at some point they're gonna get saved. You know, I I was telling earlier how. I got saved at 25, but I really believe that the seed of salvation was planted when I was a young kid, and I had, we attended for just a few years a uh, Bible-believing church that preached the right gospel. You know, and so it, it might have taken a decade or two, but I got it. You know, because nobody, sometimes it takes a little bit. Some people are more stubborn than others. I'm, I'm kind of that way sometimes. But go there to Second Peter number Second uh, Peter two, verse twelve. It says, "But these, as natural beasts, made to be taken and destroyed." Speak evil of the things that they understand not. See, what are they? What are they speaking? Their tongue. It doesn't matter what language they're. They're speaking the tongue of a reprobate, the tongue of someone unnatural, right? And they say, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceiving, uh, deceiving while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and they cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever." For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Turn over to Jude. We'll look at the parallel passage. But the thing that the, the thing I want to leave you with on that is learn to recognize, or at least be able to recognize. Most of the times, I mean, I know sometimes people get a bad rap, especially you know the type of preaching that we do that we we go around reprobating everybody. That's not true. You know, I don't think that, I mean, I've been with Pastor Randall, that, that's, that's not his spirit. But every once in a while, you just know. You know, I know Pastor Randall didn't do this on purpose, but the hotel that we stayed at the first night, there was a something. I don't know what it was. And, but I, I love the tongue that he had. The tongue that he had was the tongue of discernment. And he tried to avoid me even contacting this person the, behind the desk. This I'm not going to describe him, but just know it was disgusting. Like, it was bad enough that my soul was vexed. I didn't even want to sleep on the sheet. Like, it, it was just gross. And I'm, I'm glad I wasn't the only one that felt like that. He felt like that. But we're not going to, you're not going to preach to that guy. You're not going to just even waste your time. Sometimes it's not even worth rebuking him. They're already long gone. What I mean is, Sometimes we get in this righteous battle and we just want to prove everybody right and prove everything wrong and, and, and fight. Look, there's battles that aren't worth fighting and we are in a battle. You know, I love what you said. We send them in the wrong, uh, actually you, both of you, but we send them in the wrong place or we thought we did, but they ended up in the right place because that was the right spirit, right? And then we, you know, obviously they spoke the right tongue and they were able to lead them to Christ. But we don't want to be in this, uh, we don't want to waste our time with unnatural tongues. Yeah, like We don't want to communicate with that kind of person. Now, we want to communicate to our congregations of who to look out for, but I'm not going to engage in a conversation. Now, on occasion, do you have to engage with them? Sometimes. I mean, that's the world we live in, but I'm going to do it as little as possible. And believe me, it was as little as possible. As a matter of fact, we forgot my, my backpack and my stuff at the hotel. We went back, and we saw that same whatever it was behind the counter, and we didn't know if my room was going to be open. We just, we just took the risk. We're like, let's just go figure this out. You know, the Lord blessed. I really believe that. The cleaning crew was there, and the cleaning lady spoke Spanish, of course. I mean, people say, oh, why do you assume that all cleaning people speak Spanish? Because that's really the case. Most, pe <laughs> most cleaning people speak Spanish. I mean, and she opened the door for us. I was able to get my stuff out, and we avoided it. On the way out, we didn't even have to engage in that. You know, that's a battle we just don't want to even engage in if we don't have to. Go to there, Jude 1, verse 10. It says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Now, notice how it words it. That's why I wanted to read it. I love the way it words it. And when I spoke about the natural man, but now it says that the unnatural man, what he does unnaturally is now become natural to him. It says, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. 
Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves with fear, clouds they are with water, without water, carried about with winds, of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking in their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admirations because of advantage. You know, if, if you hear people that are, now, that doesn't mean to say, some people just are good speakers, but usually that's far and few between those that are natural, they spend a lot of time. But if you hear someone with great swelling words, and that's just like how they speak all the time, that's probably a good sign that you need to head in the other direction. But what we're fighting is, we don't, number one, we need to recognize it for the fact that we want to protect our families and our children. Number two, we don't want to engage in it. But number three, sometimes they creep into church and we need to be able to know how to spot them so we can rebuke them or get them out of the way, right? It's an unnatural tongue. Now, the third one, I don't really have a verse for you. I just wanted to touch on it a little bit, is a foolish tongue. And I know the Bible talks a lot about foolishness. But for me, really, what I was doing some research is just, you know, just wasting your time and learning things that you're not supposed to. You know, I brought this up earlier, you know, in, in Iola. But, uh, of course, we could touch on the Pentecostals. You know, they speak in tongues. The uh, Himene, hamene, whatever they say. But, you know, that one's an easy one in a, in a group like this, right? You all understand that nobody speaks in tongues like that. But, you know, what's interesting is I was just doing some research last night, and the world loves to just create tongues and waste time in stupid tongues. Now, I looked up, and it, and, and it says that, he, and uh, I found an article, 12 languages, made-up languages that you can, re, uh, that you can learn from movies. Like, and I, I thought this was a joke, but then I went on and I read, I read a little bit. There's 12 languages that people say that you can actually, people learn this. The world spends time in this like vain endeavor of learning languages that are only spoken in movies that people have watched. I mean, stuff like, I, and forgive me, I don't know what, what, what the movie, all the movies, I, I recognize some of this stuff. I'm just put the languages and I don't really care, right? But it's, there, there's a language called Natsat, I guess from some movie somewhere. Uh, Elvish, I think that's from the Lord of the Rings. I'm not going uh, Hutisi, that is, I know that's from uh, Star Wars. Klingon, uh, Miniosi, Parcella Tongue, Lapine, and I mean, I don't know. Dothraki, Alienacy, Mondo Shawan, Atlantean, and Nav Navi. Now, the reason that I took time to actually, people spend time and money learning this stuff. So much so that uh, Klingon has been, uh, at, at some point, there was some humanitarian effort, and the, when a world organization called on a group of people that spoke Klingon to help translate for people that only wanted to speak in Klingon. Like, I'm not, I, this is, look it up on Wikipedia, and if I get it, my facts a little off, I didn't print it, like I said, but the, here's the thing that I read that was really interesting, it said, Klingon's become so popular as a language, like this fake language, that Duolingo has it on their app for you to learn. So I was like, yeah, right. I mean, there's no way. I have the Duolingo app. And, and if you guys can see it here, great. If not, you know, you can come up afterwards and see it. But, you know, well, I'll pull it up. But I looked it up. You can add that lesson in, in, of Duolingo. You can spend time learning Klingon. What for? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't even like, I always thought it was made up like just gibberish for the movie apparently no somebody actually took time to develop this it's recognized as a language by the language associations and stuff it's a foolish tongue because it has no purpose so going back to the missions don't learn a language just to learn a language learn it for the purpose of jesus christ you know i mean and if you want to learn i mean i know that uh you guys listen to a bunch of different pastors i know you listen to pastor anderson and different uh uh, pastors out there, but some of them will tell you they don't, that's not their strength. Don't just do things to do it. 
I know that, for example, Pastor Anderson has learned several tongues. I'm bilingual. I know Spanish and English. That's it. I might, if I get lucky, learn uh, Greek. Um, and that's if I ever make the time. But I'm not going to waste my time in endeavors that, don't, that, that aren't food, fruitful for Christ. Does that make sense? It's foolishness, you know, the Bible says. Go over to 1 Corinthians 12. Go over to 1 Corinthians 12. The other one that I, that I wanted to point out is, and I did touch that, so this is going to sound a little repetitive for those of you that were in Iola, but it's the spiritual tongue, and that's the one that's the most important. You know, our, our speech needs to be seasoned with salt. As we grow as Christians, as we grow with, here in this church, as you guys grow, not only do you want to be loving to the world, but you want to be loving to each other. You know, the spiritual tongue is not just for salvation. It's not just for the gospel. It's also for you and each other here in this in this church. I mean, sometimes people rub you the wrong way. But the Bible instructs us to love our neighbors and to love one another. It even instructs us, it even goes so far as to say love your enemies. Not love those. I mean, we can hate those that hate God, but most people that are mad at you probably are mad at you, not God, right? It's not like someone's going around like, you know, brother Justin, I really hate you. Because I hate God. You probably rub them the wrong way and they're mad at you, right? And I'm not picking, I'm just saying everybody has. I have a lot of people that don't like me, so I know everybody has someone in their life that don't, somebody doesn't like. It's just nature. It's human nature. But 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, I would, have, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are difference, differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operation, but it is the same God, which worketh it all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given the spirit, the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh at one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And of course, we could touch on, you know, the meaning of 1 Corinthians 12. I'm not going to touch on that. What I, what I want to touch on is that spirit. It's that one spirit in Christ. See, I know that you guys are a little bit separate, right? I mean, it's now, what is it, almost two hours to go to Iola Baptist? But you guys are serving in the same church. And so you need to have the same spirit. And... and in that same spirit, there might be differences, but you got to choose what differences you want to address and what differences you don't. And even when you do address them, how do you address them? You've got to have a loving spirit if you're going to grow in Christ. Because the challenge is, if you don't love your brother and sister in Christ here, how are you going to love the one that you don't know that could become your brother and sister in Christ when you're out soul winning? You know, sometimes we do a disjustice when we don't clean things up in our church and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But yeah, we'll go soul winning all day long. You know, just patting ourselves on the back. God's not going to bless that kind of work. You know, you need to be consistent in your spiritual tongue. Don't just be like a great soul winner. You know all the verses. But then you come back and, and, and you don't have a fruitful conversation with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not saying that's the case. I, I, I've been around you guys enough. I mean, all it's been is edifying. We haven't talked about anything you know, really dumb or, you know, vain. I'm, we're humans. So I'm pretty sure we've had conversations that probably aren't the best, but I'm not, nobody here, there's not been a conversation. I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe I won't even come back to KC anymore. You know, nothing like that, right? But we want to have the right spirit. Keep going there in 1 Corinthians 12, that verse 28, and says, and God hath set some in, a, in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thoroughly teachers after that miracles, then the gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And if you read 1 Corinthians uh, 12 all the way to 14, because it is a buildup, 
It's building up to, he basically ends up re reminding you that it's charity, that it's edification. These are the things that we need to focus on. He says, you got to choose the best way. Yeah, gifts are important, but if it's not done in the right spirit, it doesn't do anything, right? I mean, I, re I remember when I was a younger man, I remember meeting Catholic priests and people said that, you know, some Catholic priests have memorized like entire, almost like the entire Bible. It's all in vain. It's just, it's just for, for show. It doesn't do anything but damn people to hell. You know, we need to have the right spirit. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, and we're there in verse 1. I'm going to step over here. i got to get some water. I forgot to get it. And uh, <clears throat> just, we've been driving around. We've been singing. We've been screaming. It's been a good time. Um, verse Corinthians 13, verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, I become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all, I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And the point I want to make here is that the Bible tells us it's that spirit that we have in us that's eternal. You know, all this stuff's going to go away one day. I mean, no matter how great, even if, if, if in the next decade or so, KC, you know, missions reaches the entire world, and you have great uh, linguists, and you, you might even help translate some versions of the Bible and do all that. The only work that's going to remain is those souls. All of this other stuff is going to fade. And the only way that it's going to stay eternal is if we have charity, if we love properly, and, you know, in God's love. Go over to Acts 16. I wanted to set that up because this is like more of a like the spiritual and the carnal for these other types of, of tongues. And like I said, this is not a, an inclusive list. And, and I just wanted you to look at the Bible from a different perspective in the sense that yeah, maybe I, we could have named it, you know, a, a ways to just find, you know, analyze people or look at character traits. I chose tongues because one of the character traits of people is what they speak right out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. It's the tongue that can do damage. The Bible tells us in James and we could have touched on those verses, but the one tongue that I, that, that I want us to be aware of also when we're looking at missions is the receptive tongue. You know, the Bible actually tells us that there's people that are looking for an answer. You know, you can think of the Ethiopian eunuch. You can think of different examples, but you're there in Acts in verse 16. I mean, Acts 16, sorry, verse 9. We see this and it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. You know what's great about the Hispanic people? They, they have some kind of uh, like reverence towards God, and they want to understand the things of God. Maybe not fully, because I told Pastor Randall, I did say that, and I, and I mean that. It is frustrating. They'll revere God, but I don't know if they necessarily fear God. And that's our goal is to get them to fear God. But first, we got to give them the gospel, right? Once, you, once you're saved and you grow in God's word, you realize that's the, one, that's the one fear you need to have a healthy fear of, is God. You know, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But it says there in verse 10, it says, and, he had, and after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go up into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Hey, there's a group of people here in Kansas that are, that are waiting for one of you guys to knock the door. And hopefully you get there before the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, you know, seriously, I was asking Pastor Randall if, there, if you guys have a lot of Mormons here. We have some Mormons. You know, I moved to a, a different part of Houston, and so now I'm dealing with a lot of Mormons. But we also have a Mormon temple row nearby. Which, by the way, those are not, like, those are far and few between, which is actually really scary. But that's a, that's a conversation for another day. But, you know, and, and he was talking about how they don't, but that every year, uh, they send like a group of Mormons to Iola, to the city of Iola. Like every year they just caravan like a, a group of people out there, right? 
we need to, and why do they send them? Because they're there to block. So what that tells me when I hear stuff like that is that the devil knows that there's people that are looking for the gospel and he's ready to intercept. So even in a town like Iola or the surrounding cities, there's people that are waiting for someone to preach the gospel to them. You know, I, I haven't really experienced that, but I've heard stories where people knock on the door and they're like, oh, I was just thinking about that. Or I was wondering about that. Or I had a question about that. I'm, I'm so glad you showed up. Can you please explain that to me? I, I've, I've been wondering for that for quite, quite some time. You know, the guy that, that kind of nudged me in the direction of salvation, his intro to me was that, you know, I was in a satanic cult and I was going to hell, you know, and that basically, uh, you know, I was damned and doomed. What's interesting about that is I was looking for answers. So that resonated with me. Don't do that to everybody. I mean, just you got to learn to read the room. But for me, it worked. But that's that's far and few between. But what I'm trying to say is there is a group of people calling. Turn over, go back to Acts 10. Go back to Acts 10. We're there in, ver in verse 1. You know, and, and if you've read your Bible long enough, if you've read the book of Acts, I'm not preaching anything new to you here. You know, that 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 could be a tongue, too. Uh the, the preacher's tongue of, like, the new preacher's tongue. If you, know, if you get all of a sudden a preacher preaching a bunch of new stuff, maybe you need to run the other direction. You know, at some point, after you've preached long enough, and I haven't been doing it for years, but you just start kind of, like, figuring out new ways to teach the same thing. I mean, the Bible is, it is a big book, but over some time, you're going to cover a lot of the same themes. And even the Bible does that. It gets very repetitive, right? It, it preaches against fornication in different forms. And it preaches against whoredoms, and it preaches against adultery, and it preaches against sin. And it gives you all these examples. Sometimes it's nations, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's just uh, certain examples. But go there to, uh, you're there in Acts 10, verse 1. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave my, much alms to the people and prayed to God always. By the way, they're a good verse for those people that want to like pervert the gospel. You know, they tell you that you have to like follow God or submit completely to God to get saved, return of all your sins, you know, things like that. This guy fears God, says he's devout. One that feared God with all his house. I mean, he feared God with everything he had, which gave alms to the people and prayed to God all. I mean, this guy's spiritual. He probably prays more than some of us, right? But he's not saved. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for me, up come up for a memorial before God. And now send me to Joppa, or Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell thee what, that, uh, what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And he had declared all these things unto them. He sent them to Jop uh, Joppa. And so we see that it's not God. You know, people are like, well, you know, if you just give them the Bible and some tracts, they're going to get saved. You know, people can just understand, why didn't God lead the centurion soldier, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Cornelius, why didn't he lead him to Christ? He had Peter do it. The other thing is, and this is a good answer, because I've seen that question before, is people are like, well, does God answer the prayers of the unsaved? It depends if they're calling for, for Christ, yeah. I mean, that's, that's biblical right there. Not only that, just because someone's devout doesn't mean they're saved. So don't ever assume that, because isn't that one of the answers we get? You know, do you go to church? Oh, I go to church. I've been going to church since I was a little kid. Okay, great. Well, if you're to die today, you're 100% sure you're going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I already know all that. What do you, what do you know? I, I know it. I know it all. Don't worry about it. I mean, am I exaggerating? No. I mean, people, that's why we got to learn the, the, the techniques and, 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 the, uh, and the skills because there, is, there are receptive tongues. But, you know, sometimes we, we blow those people off. And sometimes those people are, they are receptive. They just, you just, they just need to be nudged a little bit. And that has happened, you know, where somebody will give you a hard time and they're like basically kicking you out and all of a sudden you give them a verse that really clicks and now they're willing to listen to the gospel. That's the one that I wanted to really focus on. I'm going to close, I'm closing up here, but it's the receptive tongue that I want you guys to close on because it's a missionaries conference, right? I mean, it's a missions conference. There's people that you want to reach throughout the world. 
but not every, not every place is receptive, even here. Now, we know that. I think you've, you guys all know, and, and if you don't, we want to preach the gospel to everybody. But that doesn't mean that we don't, you know, you start. So in business, they teach you to start with the hardest task first. That's literally, I don't know if anybody's ever studied, but like they say, if you're going to do your, your list, you should start with the hardest thing first, swallow the frog so you can get on about your day and everything just becomes easier. But in Christianity, we start with the lowest hanging fruit, the most receptive first. Then we'll go to the hard part. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the hard part, but why spend all your time there? And you see people who just like constantly want to go, like for example, I mean, I know you guys you know, people want to go to Israel and lead people to Christ there. Like they don't, I think it's outlawed. I don't even think you can preach the gospel correctly there. If you know anything about Judaism, I mean, they hate Jesus Christ. Why would you go there? You know what? I'd rather spend all my time going down to the neighborhood we were at. I mean, honestly, it had been great to be there like three. We could spend a whole month there and think about how many doors, because there's doors that didn't open. We could go back today to probably the same blocks, knock the same doors, and still get people saved. I mean, that was receptive. It was fun. Even the guy that was giving me a hard time by the time I left, you know, his heart was softened because the older guy that he was with, you know, prayed right there in front of him. I mean, you, they pay attention. Hispanics are very loyal, you know, to like the elder. So if the elder does something, the other one paid attention. That's the seed we planted that I know might, might do some great things. I don't know about the guy behind me. I think he really was drunk. Like, of the three of guys, you can ask Pastor Al. I really think the guy behind us was really drunk, so I don't know that anything stuck. But, we're, hey, we planted the seed, and that's the most important thing. So what I want to close out with, go to John 4. Go to John 4. <clears throat> I got a couple of verses for you. It's if you understand that there's a receptive tongue, then on top of the spiritual tongue, you've got to also develop your like sub tongue, which is your missionary tongue. You know, so if you are going to learn a language, learn it for the right reasons. Now, if you've learned a language in the past and you just did it because whatever, well now hone that for the gospel. You know, I mean, I'm not here to beat you up for what you did in the past, but I am here to exhort you, you know, and admonish you that any work you do forward should have a purpose. You're there in John 4, and then in verse 32, the Bible says, But he said unto them, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him to eat? Jesus saith to them, My meat to, oh yeah, I'm sorry. This is, I had to write these notes afterwards, but I just want to make sure I'm in the right spot. See, I told you, uh, Pastor Rando, now I'm the one that's like fumbling over my notes, but these are my notes. He said, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that hath sent me and to finish the work. Say not ye, there are four, yet four months, and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. Both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here is that saying true, one soweth and, one re and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored and ye entered and ye are entered into their labors. Earlier today, I read about how Paul warns about how he doesn't want to build on a foundation that's all right where Christ's name has been spoken. Right. But what he's what he was alluding to there is he I mean, preaching to the choir is fun. Let me I mean, this is fun because I know that whatever I say, you guys are going to eat up for the most part. Right? You're going to be like, yeah, that's great. You know that I agree with that. But. So I'm not going to try to build on that. You know, I'll leave you with something, but this is Pastor Randall's church. That's his leadership. Let him build that. I have, a, I have my church that I, that I serve. I have my work to do. You know, that's what I need to do. But the one thing that I will take credit with is you guys built that labor. We went out soul winning, and I got to enjoy some of the labor that you guys put out there, and I got to soul win and lead people to Christ. I entered into your labors. And you know what? It was sweet because it was less work for me this time. You know, you, you did all the work, you prepared it. And I went out there with you guys and I got to take some of that credit. And if you guys are ever down in Houston, you come to, you get to take some of that credit. 
That's the labor because you're doing the will of the Lord until the work is finished. Go over to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. We'll be in Matthew and Luke, and then I'm done. My, my, I have a, a person in, in our church that says that I do that, and then I never finish. I'm trying to get better about it, but apparently I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm getting better about it. But the Bible says in Matthew 23, verse 15, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye come past sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. You know, when we're working, the enemy's working just as hard. It's not like we're out there soul winning and we're just, we have this vision of these guys, oh, these false prophets and these false churches, they're just lazy. No, they're working. They're working hard. The largest owner of real estate in the world is Catholic, the Catholic religion. You think they're not trying to convert people all the time? That's a serious thing for me to, like, when I see this, I think of it almost as a woe to me. I mean, not like how it's taken in this, but it's a warning to us. Hey, there's, not only is the battle real, they're recruiting. You know, sometimes we like to pick on, I know people love the reprobate doctrine. We're like, they're not, you know, they're not reproducers, they're recruiters. But you know what? That's not the only thing they're recruiting. They're recruiting to their false religions. They're recruiting to the road to hell. You know, I'm, I'm all for, for sometimes that hard preaching, and, and I love it. But we've got to also be aware that we got to go out there and do the work. Sometimes we want to get up on the pulpit and just kind of preach, preach the stuff that's really cool. But it's the stuff that's not so maybe flashy. That's where the real work is done. You know, the work we did yesterday, we pat ourselves on the back. It's nice. Hey, great job, everybody. Nobody else notices. You know, how many people called you up and said, hey, great job, Justin, you know. All those people you knocked on. Thank you for putting those maps together. I mean, as a matter of fact, thank you. I didn't even say that. How many people said thank you for putting all those maps together? It, you know, it's a thankless job, the ministry. I'm not picking on anybody. It is a thankless job. We take it for granted that someone's going to show up with the maps and with the Bibles and with all the, the DVDs and the, the handouts and you just show up and do the work. Somebody's doing the work. Somebody's doing the will of the Lord until the work is finished. But we need more. I mean, you think about, I don't know, do you guys have mega churches here in Kansas City? You do, right? I mean, they're, they're everywhere, but I don't know. I, I, I didn't do my research. I didn't want to, you know, they're doing the work. How many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people go to those churches? And you knock on their door and they're like, oh, yeah, I go, uh, I go to Lakewood. Oh, great. And you're going to heaven? Yeah, 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 I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I got to repent of my sins. Be a good person. Follow the commandments. That's not what the Bible says. Oh, I've never seen that in the Bible. What you been doing going to church all this time? Like, that, yeah, I mean, obviously I know why, but <laughs> go to Luke 14 and we're closing. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 14. And we're there in verse 26. <clears throat> Luke 14. Verse 26 says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulted whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsake not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt, is good. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears, let him hear. You know, sometimes the missionary, you, I didn't grow up in Baptist circles, but I, I've been to enough like Baptist churches outside of my church as I was searching church to, to experience that calling 
for the mission field. You know, who wants to go? And the thing about the Seventh-day Adventists is they recruit missionaries. So, And they do very similar things where they're like, you know, if the Lord's calling you today and you feel that tug and it's pulling on your heart, stand up and come to the front. Like they do the very same thing. But he says, count the cost. But he's not saying just count the cost for the, the cause. He's like, when you show up over there to that foreign land and you can't finish the work, you're making a mockery of the work of the Lord. And now it's twice as hard for the next guy to come and do the work because you couldn't even finish the work. And that is the truth. You know, one of the things we teach, I mean, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of, of sales training here. But one of the things that we hate as sales trainers is whenever somebody else, like when you send someone, you know, to sell something for the first time and they don't overcome the objection correctly, it's the worst. Because when they send in the sales manager, it's twice the work. Like not, not only do I have to overcome the objection you created and the problem you created, but now I have to then overcome that and then the actual objection, right? Well, if, if we're sending out missionaries with no purpose, they're not counting the cost. They're not willing to do the work. They're not willing to forsake all, you know, and I know there's a spiritual application. I mean, don't, don't hate your mother and your father. It's talking about the faith, the spirit, right? I mean, we sanctify ourselves. But if you're not going to do that work and you go over there, you're basically setting yourself up for failure, but you're also making a mockery of the work of the Lord. People are going to be like, oh, yeah, those missionaries, Pff, whatever. I, and, and I didn't know. I, I learned a lot from Pastor Randall over the weekend. I didn't know that now, you know, missionaries get called out because there's Facebook and social media, and, like, they show them basically, like, goofing off and being lazy. And that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to the work of Christ. You know, man, I know we can mock it and make fun of it, but it's embarrassing. Don't be an embarrassment here in Kansas, you know, here in, a, in a KC Missions. Don't be an embarrassment by not counting the cost. You've got to do the work so we can get the result, right? I mean, I know we preach so much about, you know, salvation is not of works, but you know what? After you're saved, there is a lot of work to be done. Don't mistake the two. It's very easy to get saved, but walking in Christ is a lot of work. And you gotta, you got to put on the, these, these uh, discerning glasses and be able to know what you're dealing with so you don't waste your time. Because let me tell you, time goes fast. And I know I don't look it, but I'm 41. And, man, I, I still remember when I was 20. And it just went by like in a flash. Every once in a while, I'll hear some, some old, you know, I'm, now I'm telling myself a little bit, but I'll hear some old hip-hop song, you know, when it, from my, like, teenage years. I feel like I just heard it like yesterday. Like I, I immediately go back to that, that era and it, it feels like it was just like not that long ago. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, it was 20 years ago. I'm like, man, that's like nuts. You know, just how did that happen? But the, the sad part is forget that is that if you spend all your time not properly disciplining yourself in the work of the Lord and discerning these things, you know, you're going to look back in 10 years and be like, man, I could have been a better soul winner. I could have done a better things. And there's always a little bit of that. I mean, of course, we're human, but you can improve. You can do that. And the way that you do that is just these are uncommon things that you might not be looking for in the word of God that will help you. You know, I mean, don't don't spend your time in arguing with the natural man. Lead him to Christ. The other thing is don't use stick to the word of God. You know, I used to be that guy that, you know, was always trying to prove the existence of God with science and, you know, you know, history and all that stuff. The word of God will do the work. These are powerful words. They're much more powerful than anything that we give it credit for. Don't waste time with the unnatural tongue. Be aware of it. Know how to rebuke it. And then get in the spirit. The Bible talks a lot about that, right? Romans 7 is a great example of, you know, basically this battle, this internal battle between the old man and the new man. And that's something we have to do daily. But in order to do it daily, we've got to get in the Word, we've got to count the cost, and we've got to go out there and do the work of the Lord. So anyways, I hope that that was helpful because I know I could talk about all the different things, but Pastor Randall told me he's already done all that work. He's given you the cultural statistics. You know a lot about the different regions you're, you're, you're trying to reach and you know the, the languages they speak. I mean, you could just come up here and I'll tell you, I didn't even know some of the stuff that I was reading up there. Like, in Mexico, there's like 29 dialects. I thought there was only a handful. So, you know, I learn something new every day. But what I do care about is that you speak God's language. You know, I said it earlier this morning, and I'll say it again. That's the language that matters. If you want to learn tongues, make sure that it's in God's language, God's word. It's the one, it's the only thing that's going to move 
the barometer. It's the only thing that's going to move the world. And we can make a change. I know it always feels like we're the smallest group and we're down and out. They have bigger pockets. They have, uh, you know, deeper pockets. I'm sorry. They have bigger guns. They have bigger knives. But God doesn't need that. We just need God on our side. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for uh, today. Thank you for just the adventure this trip was. I mean, I didn't realize uh, how much traveling we'd have to do. And, you know, I appreciate uh, churches like this, congregations like this, uh, uh, men like like uh, Pastor Randall and his family. Uh, you know, people get up and, and want to brag on themselves and tell you all the great things they're doing. <laughs> Uh, when there's churches like this that are just working hard, nobody, you know, nobody knows them uh, other than their small circles, but you know, you know the work we're doing. And ultimately, it's you that we want to please and nobody else, Lord. Help us to have a proper tongue, to use our language and our speech, uh, to be seasoned with salt, to preach the gospel correctly and to do our best every time. And I know we're going to fail as humans, but to do your will to the best of our ability so that more people can uh, be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.